when we look at the life of Queen Elizabeth, the seer is telling us to see what there is there that is noble. The nafs wants to see faults. The ruh wants to see beauty. We can judge ourselves by our reaction to these events. And now we are facing a new reign, King Charles III. We look ahead. The monarch still has a significant role in England in terms of setting the terms of the debate, affronting Britain to the world. And it is as well to remember uh, that he may well not turn out to be the Najeshi, but still he has gone out of his way to make positive remarks about Islam. Everybody knows this. He likes Islamic gardens, he likes Islamic art, he likes Islamic textiles. And he came to Cambridge years ago, not an official visit. He wanted to talk about the Qur'an. There's a lot of sense in the Qur'an, I heard him say. He could have talked about anything else in the university, but that was what was interesting to him. God has taken him on this particular journey that overcomes this stupid binary, East and West, Muslim, non-Muslim, immigrant, all of that. He wants to overcome it, and that deserves some credit. Uh, why should we not give him credit for thinking outside the box, for courting controversy? But he does it. Ten years ago, the Daily Mail got very angry when it turned out that Prince Charles had been learning Arabic. Why did he want to learn Arabic? Just so he could go to the Gulf and sell typhoon fighters or something. No, he said it was so that he could understand the Qur'an. How many people in Parliament would do that? There's something about lineage and that makes people think about deeper, timeless things. So what I want to do at the end of the khutbah is just to read some words uh, by King Charles. We have to get used to that that whether we're monarchists or not monarchists or care about this or not, it does matter that in a time of mounting Islamophobia, uh, there are some people who wish to stand with us. Let us be not tight Muslims, paranoid, fearful, suspicious. Let us recognize open-heartedness with an open-heartedness of our own. This is what he says about Islam and the West. I believe wholeheartedly that the links between these two worlds matter more today than ever before. Because the degree of misunderstanding between the Islamic and Western worlds remains dangerously high. And because the need for the two to live and work together in our increasingly interdependent world has never been greater. It is odd in many ways that misunderstandings between Islam and the West should persist. For that which binds our two worlds together is so much more powerful than that which divides us. Muslims, Christians, and Jews are all peoples of the book. Islam and Christianity share a common monotheistic vision, a belief in one divine God, in the transience of our earthly life, in our accountability for our actions, and in the assurance of life to come. We share many key values in common, respect for knowledge, for justice, compassion towards the poor and underprivileged, the importance of family life, respect for parents. Our two worlds have so often seen that past in contradictory ways. To Western school children, the 200 years of the Crusades are traditionally seen as a series of heroic, chivalrous exploits in which the kings, knights, princes, and children of Europe tried to wrest Jerusalem from the wicked Muslim infidel. To Muslims, the Crusades were an episode of great cruelty and terrible plunder, of Western infidel soldiers of fortune and horrific atrocities, perhaps exemplified best by the massacres committed by the Crusaders when, in 1099, they took back Jerusalem, the third holiest city in Islam. For us in the West, 1492 speaks of human endeavor and new horizons, of Columbus and the discovery of the Americas. To Muslims, 1492 is a year of tragedy. The year Granada fell to Ferdinand and Isabella, signifying the end of eight centuries of Muslim civilization in Europe. We in the West need also to understand the Islamic world's view of us. 
There is nothing to be gained and much harm to be done by refusing to comprehend the extent to which many people in the Islamic world genuinely fear our own Western materialism and mass culture as a deadly challenge to their Islamic culture and way of life. Some of us may think the material trappings of Western society which we have exported to the Islamic world, television, fast food, and the electronic gadgets of our everyday lives are a modernizing, self-evidently good influence. But we'd fall into the trap of terrible arrogance if we confuse modernity in other countries with their becoming more like us. The fact is that our form of materialism can be offensive to devout, to devout Muslims, and I do not just mean the extremists among them. We must understand that reaction, just as the West's attitude to some of the more rigorous aspects of Islamic life needs to be understood in the Islamic world. More than this, Islam can teach us today a way of understanding and living in the world which Christianity itself is the poorer for having lost. At the heart of Islam is its preservation of an integral view of the universe. Islam, like Buddhism and Hinduism, refuses to separate man and nature, religion and science, man and matter, and has preserved a metaphysical and unified view of ourselves and the world around us. It is a sad fact, I believe, that in so many ways the external world we have created in the last few hundred years has come to reflect our own divided and confused inner state. Western civilization has become increasingly acquisitive and exploitative in defiance of our environmental responsibilities. This crucial sense of oneness and trusteeship of the vital sacramental and spiritual character of the world about us is surely something important we can relearn from Islam. We will see if, once he has been crowned, he can continue in this pro-Islamic voice or whether he will just disappear into the role. But the heart is clearly sympathetic. And also the heart that loves nature. This is the eco-mosque representing Islam's insistence on our role as khulafa, Allah's custodians, representatives, guardians, of the beauties of creation, which are not just there to keep us fed and watered, but to remind us of their beautiful creator and source. He too has been a champion of environmentalism and was such long before it became fashionable. So let us be optimistic. Let us pray for guidance for him and for his family and for everyone. And inshallah, may this be a time of reconciliation of better understanding of the religion of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with its beautiful ease and inclusion and love for nature and love for family and love for all good things. May this be a new beginning, inshallah.